right, welcome back to What It Is on Independent Arts and Music of Asheville. We're broadcasting live on imavl.com from Lexington Avenue Brewery in downtown Asheville, North Carolina. Thanks for being here. I'm Joe Kendrick. Glad to be your host on the first video version of What It Is. And as we approach election season, it's just around the corner, we turned our thoughts towards the music of the elections in now and in the past. And you may know this, but you can do things nowadays, like go on Spotify and look at both Mitt Romney's and Barack Obama's Spotify playlists, which are a kind of a hodgepodge of almost every kind of music that you can imagine. But we're talking a little bit about some of the political themes in songs, some of the songs that are protesting one side or the another as well. We'll start with you, Kim. Um, well, when you talk about political themes in songs, the first person that comes to mind is Phil Oaks, uh, naturally, who, uh, you know, an often uh, little known songwriter from the, the 60s who uh, was, I mean, he made no mistake about his political content, his news co- topical content. He released an album called All the News That's Fit to Sing. And, um, you know, wrote songs like the Talking Cuban Missile Crisis, um, <laughs> which are, you know, there's not a lot of musicians explicitly, uh, you know, p- popular musicians that are explicitly tackling headlines like that anymore. A lot of the, the music that's getting released now is more ideological and, um, you know, dealing with uh, sort of moral standing in, in the elections. And of course, then you have all the instances of musicians asking candidates to stop using their music tom petty you know uh, did bruce springsteen ever ask reagan he did you know born in the usa he (coughs) asked them to stop using that yeah which is funny because the the dnc used a snippet of born in the usa this year and i was actually thinking that might be the first time that the artist was probably behind actually in support of of the people that are using the song you know so you, you go on these sites and you can look up <coughs> uh, some of the more topical songs nowadays. I didn't really find that much as far as songs being written uh, against, uh, you know, the incumbent or, uh, or, or the administration. I might not just have searched quite hard enough, but uh, there's a Rykuda record that is fairly popular right now. And he's, he's one of the bigger names out there as far as, a, you know, longstanding career and production work. And he's got Election Special, which is his new record, which is straight down the middle of, of songs like Mutt Romney Blues, which is singing about the famed uh, vacation that they took where they strapped the dog to the roof. And uh, you can tell right away where he's coming from. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, not this time, but but uh, a few years back when Neil Young released the uh, uh, Living With War record where he wrote that Let's Impeach the President song that was you know, caused a bit of a stir. Um, yeah, I don't know any. I don't know any albums that are out, uh, sort of attacking Obama right now. Neil's kind of funny because he he doesn't really know what he's talking about a lot of times. I mean, <laughs> in '80 he came out in support of Ronald Reagan. Right. So he's you know he he's kind of fun. sometimes he probably needs to be a little more apolitical. <laughs> 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 but you know the. Um, the uh, Born in the USA thing is interesting because I've seen that framed as like, you know, how dare Reagan steal this song from Springsteen? Doesn't he know where Springsteen stands? And, you know, I, I kind of feel like that song, if you look at the way it's constructed, it kind of lends itself to a, 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 like a hyper patriotism that's like, that, that goes beyond its um, the message. Because the message is there's a bit of satire in there. You know, it's about... Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's about like, you know, the, the struggles of Vietnam vets and it's like, but Hey, we're born in the USA. So there's this bit of, um, satire, but that's all kind of ironed out with that big boomy eighties production where the, where the verses are all buried. I mean, you don't, I mean, I grew up at that time. No one was singing along to the verses. No one even knew what he was. He was all like, rrr, rrr, you know, he's just barking like a dog and the production is, accentuates that. But the thing that you remember is the actual chorus. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of find that one interesting because I, I think it's sometimes painted by progressive as they stole it, but it's like, I feel like the, the ambiguity is, is like cooked right into that production where it's, you know. 
That's just my take on that it, one. That, that story brings back a memory to me. Acoustic Syndicate played Farm Aid in 2001, and it was actually September 28th, 2001. So it was like two weeks after the, the World Trade Center uh, bombing. And, it, you know, it was a really powerful time to be there, and there was a lot of things going on. And, you know, and uh, when Mellencamp came out and sang um, R-O-C-K in the USA, as loud as he could, I will swear to you that was the most patriotic I've ever felt, and it's such a silly song in na- in nature, but it's the same kind of thing you're talking about, just a bombastic chorus that, like, really, like, the, you could just see it, you know, and then, of course, Neil gets involved later, and he's got, you know, keep on rocking in the free world, and that was the, that was the, there wasn't a dry eye in the house for that particular thing, but, but, you know, here, here's a situation where, if you think about the body, po- body politic beyond just elections, but more in the idea of, like, national identity and patriotism, you know, I- you know, in the context of that event, but still those songs, and even Born in the USA, you know, it really, it stirs an emotion within, you know, and that, and that type of thing has been used and leveraged over, over, countless centuries i mean music is is, it's such an emotional thing that it's very easy to be used in this political context Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's the the argument is and you guys could probably as musicians you could speak to this but the the argument always comes up that you know once you release a song into the world you know it's public property or whatever which of course you know intellectual property is a is a sort of difficult thing but as as artists you you have to be able to control uh, your message on some point, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's ex- an expression of who you are. So p- people using it for the reasons that you disagree with, you know, uh, Tom Petty, you know, when, when Michelle Bachman used American girl <laughs> wrote an articulate, uh, <laughs> response to that. Um, he did. That's such an did. interesting point. Cause you're right. I, I can actually see that mm-hmm. on both sides, you mm-hmm. know, where it's like you as the artist want to, want your original intention to be honored and you want to make sure that the meaning that you're trying to convey and and in, you know in that case you know Tom Petty doesn't want to be associated with Michelle Bachman so you know I could see why you'd want to distance that self but I could also see where you're you're creating this work of art and you're putting it out into the world and it creates it becomes its own living entity and becomes its own you know assumes its own identity it could go both ways. I definitely could see that argument. Uh, personally, I think that as the artist, I would side more with Tom Petty, but I can totally understand the other other side of the argument where, you know, you're, you're giving this creation to the world and, you know, it's going to be what people represent it as. That's kind of part of what art is, is mm-hmm. you, you know, allow people to come up with their own meaning, meanings of what you create based on their life experiences, you know, so. How about you, Jonathan? Well, when I think about this topic, for some reason, I think about it in a more abstract way. I mean, everything I think pretty much is along those lines. But when I think about politics and music, I think about more like a an, uh, an underlying thing that might not just be, oh, this guy uses this guy's song and they disagree. Uh, like one thing in particular is, for example, um, my instrument, the steel drums from Trinidad, steel drums, steel pan. Um, the way that came about was from from politics because um, Great Britain actually, um, I guess they owned Trinidad at at the time and they put a ban on all musical instruments. So um, any any kind of drums that people had brought over from Africa or anything they had developed um, traditionally in that way was banned. So basically in order for them to um, make the music they wanted, they would just take random pieces of bamboo, random pieces of metal, uh, maybe metal cans, uh, soup cans, biscuit tins, and things like that. And, um, you know, and then also in conjunction with that, uh, the U.S. military actually left a bunch of oil barrels in Trinidad, left them behind after they, after they left. And that was kind of the birth of, of the steel drum. So, like, when I think about politics and music, I think about more of more of in a um, not just how do I say this? I think about it in a way where it's like it's overarching, but at the same time it's underlying. It's just not very clear on the surface. Um, it's very kind of abstract, but S- some you know, of the, the poli- physical framework yeah, of the music yeah, itself. Like, um, can be the political f- environment actually helped create this art form. Yeah, you know, so that's kind of where my head went in that sense with politics and music. Mm-hmm. That's a neat piece of history. Sort of yeah. like how saxophones got spread around so much after the war because there were so many marching bands with saxophones and they were really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> that, that also, uh, 
that's related vaguely uh, or a little bit to, um, I'm going blank, what's, what's the blues in northern Mississippi, the hill country blues with the drums, Otha Turner? Mm -hmm. Is it, they incorporated a lot of like um, military marches, mm -hmm. uh, fife, and fife and drum into uh, the blues sound. Which that stuff's pretty. It's pretty far out. Yeah, and that also predates the amplification of, say, the harmonica. So the fife, uh, the flute, that was a much more prevalent instrument, and also borrowed real heavily from African rhythms. It was, you know, more modal, more trance-like kind of blues. Mm -hmm. I've got some family history that goes back to the late 1800s. I had a. That's actually the only other member of my family that I know of that was a musician, uh, was a state senator, but he was also a fiddler. And the way that he would campaign in the late 1800s was he would travel around the state of South Carolina and play all the barn dances so that everybody would come around during social hour and he would play the dance. And then whenever the band would take a break, he would get up on the, on the box and give his, his soapbox stump speech and get everybody to vote for him. So mm -hmm. he was using, you know, even then using music almost as a propaganda tool, even though it wasn't, in, not into the modern context, but still that's how he was able to, and he won several terms. He, he, he served for a long time in the, in the state senate of South Carolina. Well, that brings up an interesting point because uh, I was doing a little research on campaign songs and FDR in 32 was considered kind of uh, a renegade because he was the first to uh, use an already established pop song. Uh, up until then, it was mainly they were getting their songs, you know, written for them or specific, you know, you can do it or Tippy <laughs> Canoe and Tyler too. But they were using, FDR used Happy Days Are Here Again, which was a big pop song. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of interesting. That was kind of the big shift. And actually, some of these are pretty funny. I was looking up some of these. Um, in 72, this one was funny. George McGovern used Bridge Over Troubled Water, which is like, <laughs> I mean, my God. I mean. <laughs> that might actually work today. If, if, maybe we should pass that one off to the Romney camp. I mean, what a bummer. <laughs> And then uh, in 88, uh, uh, this is actually far worse than I think Reagan and, and oh Springsteen. Uh, George H.W. Bush used uh, Woody Guthrie's uh, This Land is Your Land. Um, in night, this is actually my personal, my personal fave is Ross Perot. In 92, used Patsy Cline's Crazy, which I thought was a funny one. I hope Willie got a bunch of checks out of that. And then, um, <laughs> let's see. The, uh, in 2000, Al Gore used Bachman Turner Overdrive, which I thought was funny because they're from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then let's see. Oh, and then uh, Hillary used when during before the primary, she used both Celine Dion and Bachman Turner Overdrive. So we have French Canadian and Canadian <laughs> there with not a single American song. Well, she used Nine to Five <coughs> for 2008. Yeah. yeah uh, oh yeah, just here it is. Add that in. Dolly's and, all American. And then uh, I think Obama was actually, um, I think he's been his own uh, innovator with like what we were getting back at the beginning, switching from the campaign song to like the campaign playlist, which is kind of, I mean, all, you know, everyone is like one or two songs. Well, all of a sudden, 2008 broke my, it's like seven songs. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know what, talking about Mellencamp, we mentioned him. I thought this was funny. You'd think he'd be all over this list. I can only find one example of his song ever being used. That was John Edwards used Our Country, which isn't even one of his big songs, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't remember that being on MTV or anything, so. You know, for some reason, this reminds me of uh, wrestling. You know, when the wrestler comes out and they play the song? I don't know, like, just hearing that list just reminds me of, like, w, uh, WWF, yeah, yeah. WCW. <laughs> well, I was yeah. thinking, too, I think we should just get rid of the elections and just do, like, uh, whoever can sing and dance best. Mm -hmm like American Idol style and people phone in and that's our next president. Uh, well, I think we this goes to the whole idea where everybody has to wear their sponsors on their like yeah. on their on their jackets yeah. like NASCAR drivers, right. you know. Well, I mean, you know, anybody who who came of age in the 90s can never hear don't stop thinking about tomorrow yeah. without thinking of Bill Clinton, yeah. you know. Yeah. I know. They used it at the DNC this year. Yeah. yeah. And plus he did the saxophone thing on Arsenio, which yeah. was like which that was, was really considered whoa. Yeah. Bill's getting down. Do you see that thing with um, Obama on Jimmy Fallon with the roots? Speaking of music and politics, no. everyone should go on YouTube and look. That was pretty awesome, actually. But I can't believe that that Singing exists. Singing headlines. No, he's 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 speaking his point, but oh, yeah. the roots are playing behind them, and then they have background singers who are reiterating yeah. certain things that Obama's saying. That was pretty That's interesting. Yeah. That's for real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we're getting ready for election season on what it is today. We're going to take a short break, but stick around for more on imavl.com. 
live from the Lexington Avenue Brewery in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 